Given the context of uh, the conference, I have actually decided to start with showing you a seizure. And it's, uh, there are multiple motivations of doing this. Uh, it was the time I've shown this very often, I stopped doing it, but let's do it this time again. It's a lady, a patient with an implanted electrode. You hear this one, right? The seizure has started. of the basin, the coughing, the singing. The nurse is coming in trying to interact with the patient. She's patient. Okay. And now the seizure is over. So, what you've seen is the semiology of the seizure. Uh, this patient has implanted electrodes, as you see here, so-called stereotactic EEG. So it's highly invasive. Stereotactic because it, uh, you're making a face here yeah, because yeah, this is the way how it works. You make holes <laughs> into the skull and put in the electrodes. About. Uh, 60% um, of the patients we can treat pharmaceutically. Yeah? The others, 30 to 40% there, we have to find other ways. Yeah? Stimulation is something that we are working on to develop, but for the majority at the moment, the gold standard is resective surgery. And for this, you go into the brain to sample the activity, and you have to do this during uh, a long time because with scalp EEG, very often you don't capture a seizure, and the seizure is the one that is most informative. Uh, so here you go into the brain and if possible also to the deeper structures like the hippocampus, amygdala. So uh, th there we have most of, uh, f about 50% of all the seizures are temporal lobe seizures. Uh, and uh, what you have seen right now was an implantation. Uh, and uh, here you see the time series that were recorded and on the bottom you see my capture of what you have seen on the behavior. So there are two levels of your focus, the seizure, intracranial recordings, and behavior. Remember behavior, consciousness, this was also a discussion that we had multiple times. Yeah? And what are the correlates of the behavior in the brain? And this is actually uh, where I wanna go. When in the beginning, here, the seizure onset is uh, considered here. In particular, in these areas, you already have pre-ictal spiking, large population spike activity in these areas. Yeah? And then uh, you, you see some of the seizure activity, uh, some of the first organizations occurring here in these areas, which coincides actually with the onset of the semiology. Remember the coughing, uh, the rocking of the bazin? Yeah? Then she touched her nose multiple times. Yeah? This, from one seizure to the other, it is reproducible. Yeah? This is a very, very rare seizure, and it's also easy on the eye. But that's uh, one of the reasons I'm showing it. In particular, please point note here this very fast activity, low amplitude, fast, and then it starts becoming stronger. This is in the temporal lobe. Yeah? And then you have a seizure organization, multiple spikes until you get seizure offset, and this is the evolution here. So look at this uh, from the context of the discussions that we had over the last almost three days. Yeah? Behavior, how can we describe the behavior? We have, we're discussing about sequences of structured behavior. Here you saw we had a very clear dynamics. Nevertheless, there are still motor primitives. In uh, psychology, we would speak about cognitive or motor primitives. You can block it, as I did in here. But every block is a particular dynamics. Now, if you go in parallel into this uh, uh, brain dynamics that accompanies the behavior, you're trying to extract some of its correlates. What is it? Uh, we know there are some pathological signatures, in particular in, on the fast, the discharges. But somewhere in there, there must be also the coding for the more slower dynamics, probably not state activations, but time courses, somehow rule-based 
behavior that is capturing the normal behavior in there, and it's intermingled. Yeah? This is the complexity that we are dealing with. This chunking into individual states is not always a solution. In particular, it's very obvious that it will not happen in this case. And just cross-correlational analysis will get you absolutely nowhere here in this case because it's dominated by the pathological features. So that's what I wanted to get across. And uh, a good handle on behavior, in particular the evolution of these trajectories, must be critical. Yeah? Not only to understand what is happening in the signals, but also to understand some of the questions that we asked over the last few days. Yeah? And there is actually a field in cognitive psychology called uh, ecological psychology yeah? that is trying to describe dynamics on the behavioral level phenomenologically through a lawful uh, uh, um, a rule-based behavior. One of the leaders there is uh, a good friend of mine, Scott Kelso. I, I spent many years with him. And uh, Herman Haken, who has contributed much uh, to, to its formalization. Lucia, is Lucia still here? Yeah. I don't see her. Yeah. OK, Lucia brought up a very nice slide indicating the structure and the sequentiality of uh, the behavior. We saw this also from Stanislas. Yeah? So this plays a role. But in this particular context, Stan made a very good comment in the context of Bobby McFerrin. Did you notice then when the surprising element came, yeah, the audience was able to predict it. So there is, what we are looking for is actually a rule-based system to address this. It came up in other contexts before. Some people called it internal models. An internal model in predictive coding in cognitive psychology is nothing else than another set of rule that is trying to prescribe a lawful behavior. But what is the mathematical object thereof? The sequentiality here that we see here captures one aspect of it, this chunking, but it cannot be all. You saw the dynamics, this intermingling. It's time evol uh, evolving. Uh, in mathematics, we describe this through uh, dynamic equations. When we talk about uh, dynamics, uh, um, there are different ways of nonlinear dynamics, different ways of capturing it, but every single time it is a dynamically evolving system and the rules that are generally generating the trajectory. One, signal traje one single trajectory will not get you anywhere because any jitter or perturbation thereof is not being captured by one single trajectory. You need the rules that make a statement about the stability of it when you perturb it, or maybe multi-stability if you have any nonlinear system. So this is being captured by low-dimensional dynamic systems and um, by a set of trajectories and in behavioral biology, in fact, they came to the same conclusion. Yeah? Not a single coordinated action, but actually a set of internally coordinated actions that are meaningful in a particular way. This set means we need to capture a dynamic object, which is the trajectories in a space in which rules are implemented by flow vectors that drive the trajectories and predict the behavior. Yeah? This is what we call structured flows on manifolds in nonlinear dynamics. Yeah? So this is a low dimensional subspace. We still are operating in a high, huge dimensional subspace. But there must be somehow um, a mechanism that uh, reduces us to this relevant subset. This is the key question. And this is then called behavior. The question came up by Katinka yesterday evening. Yeah? Many questions came up. Here are just a few examples from ecological psychology. Uh, from music, for instance, da 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 da, Beethoven's Fifth, or handwriting, you can actually capture this. We call these end effectors and map it in a state space in which then trajectories evolve. And you can actually formulate the mathematics that is behind that in order to start having low dimensional systems capable of writing sequences or playing certain motives. Yeah? Uh, let's ignore all these aspects of learning and encoding, et cetera. That's not my point here. I'm trying to identify what is the mathematical object that we need to prescribe that has this type of properties. This is a beautiful work from uh, Brennan Proict, actually, where they have worked with C. elegance, 
where they have recorded movement data and actually um, uh, neuroimaging data, and they have actually extracted, performed nonlinear decompositions of the subspace and projected all the data and tried to reconstruct the different sets of behaviors and ordered them in terms of behavior, as you see here. Again, motor primitives, pretty much as the way you have seen it before. And then identified the subspace in which the individual movements meaningfully and lawfully can be represented. Yeah? So if we plot it, and they did not do this, yeah, but if we plot it here, uh, uh, um, arrows that would predict the uh, dynamics, they've done it to some degree, yeah? then you have actually a prescription of the dynamics of how the system can evolve. This is experimental. Very, very beautiful work. Yeah. Um, so how can these aspects be captured and described? And in the 70s, 80s, Hilman Haken created the field of synergetics, essentially coming from the theory of self-organization. And that was the time, that time there were uh, first references in biological cybernetics and then uh, uh, autopoiesis in the philosophy. Yeah? theories of emergence and self-organization. This gentleman here was the father, the founding father that actually formalized it mathematically. Yeah? And the key to that in this work was an assumption in mathematics um, or a theorem in mathematics uh, which is called center manifold theory. So if you operate to somewhere a transition point, like the transition from solid to fluid, yeah? So we call this a bifurcation point. Or any type of transition from uh, disordered light to laser light. This is where Hermann Harkin actually made major contributions. Yeah? These qualitative critical points, criticality. Julia, you ask a question on criticality. This, in the neighborhood of these critical points, when you operate there, yeah, then the center manifold pr uh, theorem predicts that you have a compression onto a low dimensional subspace. And then depending on the dynamics, you have an evolution uh, evolving along these lines. But it requires the proximity to a phase transition point. And that is sometimes maybe meaningful, maybe not meaningful. It works. Yeah? It's generalizable. Do we have this uh, uh, case all the time? Open question. Yeah? There is another way to think of it which requires another assumption. Yeah? And this is called equivariant systems, namely that you're operating close to symmetry. And that's a point that I'd like to emphasize here today, and that's a perspective I wish to take. Here, the operating point is close to symmetry. Since symmetries are omnipresent in uh, uh, complex systems, and here in this representation, imagine you have a network that has all-to-all -all coupling. Everything is identical, no symmetry breaking whatsoever. Under these conditions, you will always have, and this can be shown mathematically, a manifold in state space in which you may or may not get attracted. Stability is not predicted. But what, if it's attractive, you can go on it, and then you are actually invariant under translation. This is actually what equivariant means that there is a transformation that gets you from one point on the manifold to another one, and it's always the same solution. It's invariant. Yeah? The smallest symmetry breaking can actually then cause a flow, or uh, not can, always causes a flow on this low dimensional subspace that is meaningful, the type of lawful behavior we just discussed. That's a way of demonstrating a low dimensional subspace uh, and a meaningful behavior on that. And as we discussed, it captures behavior. What I want to do here now is take it, take this way of thinking of equivalent dynamics, put it in the context of neural systems, neural networks, and then make a proposal for how it can code for tasks, and then we uh, render it pathological, epileptic, paroxysmal oscillations, and then see if we can make use out of this. You recognize this young, good-looking gentleman? Yeah, that was a few years ago. <laughs> Still the same. Same outfit. <laughs> uh, I, why I'm putting Alain here is I want to talk about neural masses. A majority, uh, he talked about mean field dynamics. Almost exclusively, all population models yeah, have a generic feature when you reduce them. 
unless you add adaptation or something like this. The, uh, Wilson Cowan, Janssen Ritt, etc. They can they always reduce to a type of dynamics which is two dimensional. In this case, uh, it's firing rate and mean membrane potential. Yeah, and you have two states: a down state and an up state. As we saw actually in our last presentation, down state, up state, and the up state typically is oscillatory, a stable spiral. There are many uh, variations thereof, but this is the gist. I invite you to keep in mind to look at this line here. This here is a threshold. Then we have a down state and up state. And if we ignore the oscillatory part for a moment, then we, I can actually uh, plot the system like this. We have a one-dimensional system. And if I plot what is called the null line, which is the zero flow, look, these are the red lines here, actually, r dot equals zero, v dot equals zero, then uh, the intersection with that, we live only in one dimension. This is one stable fixed point, another stable fixed point, a threshold. Let's look at this simplification here and build out of this a network. Yeah? But this is a neural mass model we have discussed in Alain's talk, a little simplified. Yeah? And um, when I take this one node and build a two node system out of this, two coupled nodes, then one node, two nodes, and this is a stable fixed point of the first node, of the second node, and along this dimension it's a second node, one and two. But now we have R in two dimensions, so essentially this is a down-down state for the two nodes, up-up state, up-down, down-up, essentially. I'm spanning it, but they're uncoupled, so it's trivial. Yeah? Now we introduce a coupling, and we, uh, the way you do it in your masses, and when you do this you start deforming the flow. Yeah? You see, it's uh, uh, the null, these are again the null clients, and when I start making the coupling stronger and stronger, what I'm generating is actually an equivariant uh, manifold, completely circular. When you get on it, there is no flow whatsoever. When I break the symmetry a little bit, fixed point, fixed point, stable fixed point, stable fixed point. Yeah. So um, this I can always do. Yeah, and uh, let me show you the principle one more time. One note, second note, yeah, I'm here. Now it's all to all coupled, under full coupling, full symmetry. Then I break the symmetry a little bit, and then these null clients, so x dot equals zero, y dot equals zero, where they intersect, I generate fixed points all the time, yeah. And uh, this is a very generic behavior under the symmetry, and then if this is an unstable fixed point, I'm going here to this fixed point and there. And I can, depending on how I break the symmetry, I can generate arbitrary dynamics limited on this um, uh, manifold. Arbitrary dynamics, arbitrary behavior, uh, following the rules that prescribe any type of evolution. Here a little simulation with multiple intersections, in fact. Here the red ones being stable fixed points, black ones unstable. And you see puff going down. Most of the dynamics, uh, this, uh, the slow dynamics, occurs all on the manifold. This is a relevant task, relevant dynamics. Everything else goes fast and it's attracted to it. Here you see the time series. If I add noise, and keep this in mind also, if I add noise, essentially the noise is driving the system. If you're buying this concept of equivalent manifold yeah, with task relevant dynamics on it, then what noise is doing, it's actually sampling the possible state of behavior. So more uh, around the stable fixed point, unstable fixed points are being avoided, but this is what is happening. Many people, or some people in this group here, like Jan Fosek or Giovanni, uh, they are exploring this for a representation of resting state manifolds, yeah? where you have actually this type of structure that is being explored. Yeah? You can generalize this, from two nodes to three nodes, and then you have a matrix, or a cube in this case, or for n-coupled nodes, and then you have so-called hyperspaces. They can be low dimensional, yeah, and uh, in a very, very high dimensional space. Yeah. Uh, here you have an example in a 50-dimensional network 
where three-dimensional space is being spanned with a particular dynamics. And it doesn't have to be fixed points. It can be uh, trajectories that enter at some point. It can be limit cycles. So it's arbitrary dynamics that can be coded in this type of behavior along the requirements we discussed earlier. So this is a structured flow on a manifold. An example of a 20-dimensional simulation in a three-dimensional uh, subspace or two-dimensional manifold with two fixed points. And here you see the same simulation, but now I'm putting the sphere there, so you see it's a sphere. Two fixed points, and this was uh, RJ Peel I did many years ago. He stimulated it, and then it goes from one fixed point to the other. So that is the situation. Um, um, essentially, this is what you can build when you have this very generic model of neural masses. Yeah? Something I did not tell you is how does this reduction to the subspace occur? In Harkin's concept, synergetics, where you have the operation close to an, uh, a criticality, it's always attractive. That's not the case here, actually. Yeah? The case here is you have a relevant subspace, but it does not necessarily attract. This is where the simulation is, oh, sorry, the oscillations come in. They actually, when you drive it with noise, the irrelevant subspace, they interact, they are asynchronous, they start averaging out. We call this, in mathematics, we call it rotating wave uh, approximation, where the fast oscillating dynamics decouples from the relevant slow dynamics and actually uh, is ongoing, yeah? But it doesn't interfere because of the time scale separation, and there the dephasings, the decorrelation averages out. Of course, when you have then changes on the task relevant manifold, what happens? You have non stationary transitory correlations, but they do not play necessarily a role. Two different concepts, not a reduction in some space, but averaging out. A uh, very big importance of asynchronous dynamics in this particular context. Okay. This is what I wanted you to keep in mind as a kind of theoretical framework. What if this type of oscillation start rather than spiraling down to this fixed point under a certain mechanism start becoming unstable, paroxysmal, yeah? pathological. Yeah? Then we deal with pathomechanistic origins of oscillations and we call this epilepsy. And uh, this is actually what I'd like to exploit with you. This has happened over the last 10 years, in, uh, almost 10 years by now, in my lab, where before actually the formulation of this object, we wanted to systematically characterize this. And um, when you take actually the, if this is a down state or the resting state, uh, if this oscillation starts destabilizing, yeah, what is actually happening, it's, it start uh, building up a spiral. Yeah, a limit cycle. If it's higher dimensional and there is an additional slow dynamics, it starts getting actually unfolded in this direction until the oscillation stops and it returns. Yeah. Um, here you have an example from Intuto, Hippocampus, Rat, Christoph Bernard and Anton Ina uh, Ivanov in my institute. We are good collaborators. Extract the hippocampus in Tuto. Yeah, put it in uh, epileptoform conditions, in this case low magnesium, in CSF, and actually look at the time scale. Uh, you get a train of fast dynamics, slow, fast discharges, slow. This is extracellular potassium that was recorded. You can also uh, check recordings on oxygen or ATP. They trace out a very similar time course here. You recognize a slow dynamics that is actually coincident with this particular dynamics. Whenever we have this, yeah, then uh, a so-called fast, slow system, we can actually separate this, making a time scale separation using the similar techniques I uh, referred to earlier, and write it in this particular form, and systematically actually categorize it by an onset bifurcation, so this destabilization here at the lower state, going into this high state and then evolving the oscillation. Here you see simulation thereof, oscillation, offset, this is the offset bifurcation, and back to this, yeah. Uh, in the zoom, you see actually the behavior here, yeah. What we have taken advantage of, this is a geometry of epilepsy, yeah, at least of most parts of epilepsy that undergo a bifurcation for onset and offset. 
and the majority does actually of focal partial epilepsies. And um, there was a mathematical treatment. I'm just putting, I cannot go the, in, into this here. This is a mathematical object. This is an experimental representation, yeah, from uh, patient data, in fact, yeah. The spiral, the fast discharges, the offset, and then the resting state. The mathematical treatment is here. It's a little high level, but uh, very, very interesting to, uh, to read. It is focusing on the uh, characterization of the onset and the offset bifurcations of this particular object. But this is the structured flow on manifold. Once it destabilizes from the system, it becomes pathological, as we discussed earlier. This is the shape it takes. You can build a taxonomy for onset or offset bifurcations. This is an offset bifurcation. It has different properties, changes of amplitudes as it approaches the onset, frequency changes, and it's either bidirectional or unidirectional. So you can actually go into the data and start testing it and start actually mapping out the scaling properties of this in order to classify the project and uh, ex uh, uh, start characterizing it. You can build a real taxonomy based on the geometry of dynamics. Yeah. Uh, Marisa Saggio and uh, Bill Stacy have done that, together with uh, 11 other laboratories coming from all over the world, Japan, Australia, multiple ones in Europe, in the US. Uh, so that was a huge work collecting human seizures, more than 2,000 uh, uh, seizures from more than 100 patients. Why? Um, it, we need DC recordings, and that's very rare. Yeah? Typically, we have AC recordings, in particular because what was looked for are these baseline jumps, because that's predicted by actually the taxonomy. And there, uh, it turned out that uh, once you pair it into dynamo types, so this pairing of one onset bifurcation and one offset bifurcation, you can mathematically characterize it. And it turns out that 80% were characterized by one uh, type, 15% by the second type, and all the others were a little more dis uh, distributed. It can be actually predicted from the properties of the geometry of the trajectory, because you can actually count the number of parameters that need to be varied. In mathematics, we call this co-dimension. Yeah? So the more parameters you need to vary in order to fix a bifurcation, the more complicated it is, the more outside control it requires. Yeah? So the less likely it is. This is actually what was found, that uh, the uh, two relevant dynamo types, yeah, were actually the one with the lowest degree of complexity, yeah, coming purely from a prediction of the analysis of the geometry of the dynamics of the system. No correlation with any clinical uh, uh, typification, though. Yeah? So this is what we hoped for. Even one patient during a seizure, it can actually change this type. Yeah? OK. Um, having said this, what I wanted to share with you is a way of thinking, behavior, how we need to capture it, even though the sequential structure over the last few days we got dis, uh, convinced, but there is more to it. There is stability. It's more than just one trajectory. It's a set of trajectories. There is a certain basis of it in neuroscience, and we can render it pathological such that it becomes actually uh, a paroxysmal, as we have seen. We can now take this particular object, yeah, the uh, geometry of epilepsy is this particular spiral, and start building brains out of this. Yeah? It can be informed by biomechanistic mechanisms, but this is not what the focus is here. We want to build brains and see if we can actually individualize them. And Mamadou has given a very nice workshop this afternoon talking about the virtual brain simulator composed of the connectome. And uh, it came up multiple times. I don't want to do this here. Uh, I, all I want to say is essentially um, a recap of some of the elements we can do today. So first of all, we are capable of convincingly personalizing, or it, let me say individualizing individual brains. And that means using, when we build a virtual brain, using an individual's own connectome and own data, the predictive power under almost any set of metrics, your preferred metrics, is better predictive than when you use a generic data set or connector. Yeah? This is uh, what I mean by personalization. 
does it hold generally? Actually, um, there are issues because you now you can also ask a question, what if we go to higher resolution? Yeah? And this has been tested systematically. And um, high resolution has actually informative power. Yeah? Uh, so Francesca Melozzi has shown this very, very beautifully using data from the Elm Connectum, high resolution data. And uh, high resolution has an immense predictive power. We have false positives in uh, DDI data. So uh, we need to connect and combine these two things. Individuality has predictive power. High resolution has predictive power. But these two things are orthogonal. Yeah? One is ex vivo, the other one is in vivo. Yeah? So we need to get this together. And that can be done, not exclusively, but it can be done by one means, which is hierarchical Bayesian modeling, where you can, for instance, use the high resolution template, which comes from ex vivo, and then bias it through a prior coming from the individual in order to push it into a particular direction. Yeah? So this works. This is a workflow that works. And then we can use Mama Duke spoke about this uh, today also, use some uh, sampling techniques, inference, in order to estimate the parameters. We can improve this. We can include regional variability, uh, for instance, uh, coming from uh, uh, experimental data. But we still need to estimate this because the individuality is important. And this is lots of work that has been done in the past few years in epilepsy and uh, applied to retrospective data. In fact, now there is a prospective data collection process going on. It's a clinical trial, a multi-site clinical trial in which this personalization of brain models is being used as a target to fit the epileptogenic zone in individual patients and then perform surgery on the patients because that is a target actually for the therapeutic intervention. Um, this is what it looks like. One example, we are providing a so-called heat map. Yeah? And it's in a decision-making process uh, by the clinicians. They look at all the other data and include this information into their decision-making process. And then they decide about what surgery is being affected. Here you see an example where the post-surgical MRI corresponds quite well to the heat map that we proposed. And an example where it corresponds less well. Yeah? For the retrospective data, uh, so for the prospective data, this is currently the inclusion. Um, so we are halfway. This was December. I think we are about 250 patients. In order to be able to have a statistically significant power to make a statement about the contributions of this new technology, where we need about 400 patients. Osha, how many minutes do I have? Seven Sorry? Seven. Thank you. Yeah, 17, she said, right? <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm we almost can, at, I'm, I'm all, almost at the end. Yeah, but I want to show you a few things. For the seizure-free patients, correspondence of VEP, this is what we call the uh, workflow, and this uh, clinical hypothesis, the precision or specificity, it works quite well. This is just retrospective patient, uh, patients. Yeah. For non-seizure-free, non-seizure-free means uh, regaining a, a seizure activity within a year after the surgery, it actually drops significantly. Yeah? And there is uh, much other statistics ongoing. But what I wanted to sh share with you is essentially uh, a just a pointer for the future for, with regard to the higher resolution. Current state of the art, what we are doing there is we are using the virtual brain modeling approach with about 164, that's the resolution we have, 164 nodes, which corresponds to 16 to 18 square centimeters each patch. This is actually huge, if you think about that. I told you high resolution matters. Yeah? So the approach is that we are building a common space. C can come from different regions, uh, uh, sorry, different sources. But we need a common reference space and spatial mapping, coordinate transforms from different spaces uh, that allow um, uh, to map the heterogeneous data features to be mapped into the same reference space. One example would be, for instance, the big brain histological space. So there we are in the 20 micrometer uh, reference uh, space. This is work uh, performed by Jean-Francois Mangin that has uh, generated nonlinear spatial transformation between the individual spaces trying to match it to a best these resources. That allows us to build then a high resolution space. 
This is in eBrains, but it's not functional yet. <laughs> what is functional is the following, actually. We take an individual's topographic uh, uh, MRI. This we can manage to one millimeter square, perform the cortical and subcortical reconstructions, and then connect it to uh, work from uh, CERA, that is Cyril uh, Poupon and colleagues, which is called the Chenonceau Project, where they have reconstructed also an ex vivo brain with very high resolution, yeah, to a very uh, high, uh, so very high resolution, high field MRI, getting up to 200 uh, uh, micrometer uh, uh, resolution, reconstructing the individual tracts. We map this. This is becoming our template for fitting, in which we are uh, then biasing with the individual connector. And that allows us then one score register to do things like this. This is simulation. This is real data from uh, Kathy Chavon's lab. Actually, multi-scale data, electrocorticogram, activity that propagates. And here, this is a micro uh, uh, electrode array that is implanted here. You see, it has multi-scale activity. You see these propagating waves, ari uh, uh, arising circular structures in here. Uh, on, on that, and this is one of the things that demands the high resolution. We are incapable of describing it in a low resolution uh, respect. And you see the same coming out uh, very qualitatively out of the uh, dynamics. And this is actually uh, something we see systematically. And uh, just a quick example, this is rhinal cortex implementation, tracts coming out of the rhinal cortex going into the other hemisphere within the same hemisphere, connectivity strength mapped. We uh, increase the epileptogenic zone, uh, the epileptogenicity of the parameter here, and then we can run a simulation. And please note, activity starts, propagates, starts organizing itself, and this we see every single time. Also in experimental data, it organizes itself in propagating waves, uh, and very often spiral, and this has been hypothesized to be a stopping mechanism yeah, uh, of this activity. And well, there is one feature I'd like to point out here. It's actually very nice, and then recruiting further areas further in the back. Of this, nothing has been validated yet, but please look at the following. Stop. I was a little too late. Do you see this activity? It started here. It started here, and then it did not propagate through the cortical sheet. It's a heterogeneous fiber that goes here and causes that, uh, the emergence of this activity. And only at the subsequent steps, it starts continuing and organizing itself. Yeah? Uh, you need a mixed system in order to be able to work with this. Yeah? So continuous, high resolution. What? Uh, that was 100 milliseconds. Yeah. So uh, the time scale of these uh, oscillations of the spatial temporal time scale was uh, uh, several hundreds of milliseconds. Yeah. yeah. So it was a fast discharges uh, uh, during the seizure. Yeah. Um, now you can actually uh, also continue and start taking uh, the hippocampus, for instance, which actually continues nicely with the uh, corona ammonis, the CA4, CA3, CA2 regions that are actually continuously connected and loop into itself. That, uh, these are now things that you can actually organize and integrate and have then activity propagating at this high resolution uh, into a CA1 region and then uh, starts uh, propagating continuously in space, recruiting the other activity. And uh, as a final statement, what is also possible in eBrains right now, if you want to start not working on the uh, mean field level, but interrogating with the pathomechanistic uh, origins of how the seizure arises, you can actually make mixed uh, simulations of the virtual brain, mix it with NEST. This is work that is being done with uh, Michele Migliore and Egidio D'Angelo. You can actually uh, the data in this case come from Javier de Felipe. You can actually identify the positions of every single neuron in the human CA1 area, uh, map it, reconstruct it, equip it with a neuron model, in this case Hodgkin-Huxley equation type, compute the probability clouds that are coming from uh, the, the data and compute the connections. Yeah? This is probabilistically. And actually run this type of 
simulations, the physiological functions need to be approximated also from ex vivo hippocampal slices, but this data we don't yet have sufficiently, so their rat uh, data is best approximations, but this is done in the context of the surrounding network, and here, sorry, in the context of the surrounding network, and this here is in isolation. So it changes the dynamics, context matters. I'm stopping here. Everything I showed you is available in eBrains as uh, Python workflows, individual work, uh, individual showcases, so can be executed in this particular form here. I thank you for your attention. These are my colleagues and friends, and these are the fundraisers.